Once upon a time, the American chestnut was the predominant tree in the Appalachian mountain range. Surveys taken in the colonial times have documented measurements of 20 to 25 percent of the trees being American chestnut in the range. Segments of Jack Swatt's lecture and walk focus on the value of this iconic tree, the reasons for its disappearance, and the current efforts in play to resurrect the American chestnut. So the chestnut was a very important commodity, for, uh, especially for people that were settling in the, uh, the forests of the Appalachian Range in the early days. Um, the nuts provided uh, food not only for people, but also for wildlife. Um, the wood was rot resistant, so it was you know, prized for lumber and um, other uses for wood. And uh, the bark was also high in tannins. They used to you use the bark for, um, for tanning industry. Um, even in the early days, the American Indians collected chestnut as one of their food, uh, food products. Um, you've yeah, heard of roasting chestnuts. That's the, the way people remember it from the Christmas Carol there. But um, there are a lot of other uh, ways that chestnut can be used for food. Um, besides roasting, it's good even in salads and stuffing, uh, making soups out of them. Um, the wildlife uh, used to feed heavily on the, uh, the nuts. Um, actually, there are quite a few animals that relied on chestnuts. So, you know, obviously, bears and you know deer have strong enough teeth too. But even turkeys and uh, um, I think that's a grouse up there as well with a nest in a fallen chestnut. Um, uh, mentioned the wood. The wood was um, resistant um, to decay and everything, so it was widely used for telephone poles, railroad ties. Um, but also, the wood was a very hard wood, and it was used a lot in making furniture, too. And they also called it the cradle-to-grave tree, or the crib-to-coffin tree, as uh, some names they called it, because you know, they used it when you were born, as well as when you passed. So what happened to the American chestnut? The chestnut blight uh, came, uh, another typical invasive species story, where uh, something's brought in, imported, and gets spread in the environment, and then you know, wreaks havoc. First found um, the chestnut blight, which is actually called the chestnut bark disease. Um, they were importing some Japanese chestnuts around the turn of the century. They suspect that um, some were brought into New York City because they first found evidence of blight in 1904 at the Bronx Zoo. Shortly afterwards, it just spread from tree to tree throughout the entire range. You see how in 1904 it centered in New York City area, and then even in Connecticut, very quickly it spread throughout Connecticut, and they were gone through Connecticut. It made it through the whole Appalachian Range by 1950. See how up in the left-hand corner are some black dots up in Michigan and Wisconsin? Um, some people had brought chestnuts in the early days when they went to settle up there and planted some trees and they, they reproduced and you know, made some groves up there. There is one particular grove in Wisconsin where the trees were still blight-free up until 1990. But eventually the blight got in there as well and uh, some of the trees started dying. Yeah, it, it's airborne, so it, it spreads very quickly. So they did a lot of things to try to prevent it, obviously, when they first found it. You know, they tried cutting down trees for miles, you know, mm -hmm. to try to stop its spread, like they do with a lot of the other ashes. But because it was so windborne, it, it was able to, you know, it was like wildfire, just hop the, the breaks that they made. So this is what the chestnut blight looks like. Um, basically, it, um, it's a fungus that it has kind of like an orangish color you can see in the petri dish up in the upper right hand corner. Um, what it does, it gets in through a wound in the bark and then uh, secretes an enzyme called oxalic acid and that kills the bark and then the fungus eats the dead bark. So it's what's called a saprophyte. Um, it also infects Chinese chestnut, Japanese chestnut, and European chestnuts, but in the American chestnut it's so virulent that it um, gets into the cambium layer and completely surrounds the tree and girdles it, and that's what kills the, the tree. So like I said, the blight kills the stems of the tree, um, but it doesn't affect the roots of the tree. So the tree is not extinct. Um, the roots still survived, and what they do is they send up sprouts, and they grow until eventually, you know, the blight kills them again, and then they send up more sprouts. So it's a constant cycle of just sending up sprouts and then the blight killing the stems back. They're in the forest well below the canopy, so they're not getting enough light to grow quick enough to, to flower and everything. Um, so even though they're not extinct, it's what we call functionally extinct. They're not reproducing on a large enough scale, but they're still surviving. Uh, nut growers had been crossing the Chinese and Japanese uh, with American chestnuts uh, for decades even before the blight struck. So once it wiped out the trees, they started focusing research on seeing if they could develop a hybrid which had the blight resistance, but also showed American characteristics. So uh, the American Chestnut Foundation uh, was founded back in 1983 by uh, Dr. Charles Burnham, as well as a couple other scientists as well, but I think he was the key motivator. Um, 
What they decided to do was, uh, the plan was to develop, breed a Chinese, actually we're calling it Chinese uh, blight tolerant uh, tree now, and return it back to the forest. And what he was hoping to do, instead of taking a just American and Chinese hybrid, which is like 50% American, he wanted to back cross it through several generations. So if you can see up in the, the top there, each time they cross it with another American tree, um, it becomes more and more percentage of American. Um, up and through three generations, then it would be about 95% American or 15 sixteenths. And each then after we reached that 15 sixteenths tree, then he wanted to cross them with each other to try to amplify the resistance genes. Because um, each step of the way we're weeding out Chinese, but we could be losing some of the genes for resistance. So we wanted to cross them again to, to reassemble all the, the genes that are responsible for resistance. Um, while I have this up here too, um, we're going to be visiting an orchard here at um, um, White Memorial. That was one of the early test orchards. So what they did is they had um, trees that were, um, we're calling B2 F2. So it wasn't a full third back cross. They got to the BC2 stage, which are 88% American, and crossed them just to see how well they would grow in Connecticut environment. Uh, a lot of the early research was done in Virginia. Uh, the final step, the final tree, um, um, the final American that they crossed with to get to the 15 sixteenths, they wanted to be a tree from um, the state that it's going to be grown in. So all the trees in our Connecticut orchards, the last American was a tree growing in Connecticut. So basically right now we're, we have three different methods that we're trying to achieve the uh, resistance to the chestnut blight. Uh, we mentioned the back cross breeding already. Uh, another method is um, biocontrol. Um, since the uh, blight fungus is out there in the environment, it's susceptible to being attacked by viruses. Mm -hmm. And when they, first, when they first found the blight in Europe, they actually found that, remember I showed you those orange uh, sporules? Mm -hmm. In Europe, they were white. So scientists started looking to, well, why are these ones coming out white? And the trees weren't being you know, killed off as much. And they found out that that strain of the fungus was weaker than the ones we had in America. Uh, and they found that it was caused by a virus transmitting uh, something that gave it, uh, that weakened the blight fungus. Actually, they did a lot of work on hypovirulence. Um, Dr. Sandy Agnostakis, I believe her name is, did a lot of work with um, trying to see if they can get um, a blight fungus that they could just spread to all the different trees and it would make them weaker. Um, the problem was they found out was that um, it wasn't that simple. They could take the fungus from a tree and convert it with the virus and then return it to the tree but they couldn't make one fungus that they could just spread to everything else. It didn't transfer the virus. There's a little more and the, they needed some kind of communication between the, the hypovirulent fungus and the blight fungus on the tree and it didn't always happen in nature. But we've advanced a little bit more with that too. So they're working on, I think University of Maryland is working on a strain right now that they hope will be a universal donor type of uh, fungus that um, you know, may be able to spread to other trees and it'll spread from tree to tree. And then we're also using biotechnology. This is where we're getting into more of the genetic uh, manipulation. So back in 1990, partnered with SUNY Syracuse, they have found out a way to transfer genes into the chestnut genome that give it a little bit of blight uh, mm -hmm. uh, tolerance. The way the fungus uh, kills the tree, as I mentioned before, is that it secretes oxalic acid. Mm -hmm. So there's an enzyme that's found in nature in several other plants called oxalate oxidase. It's an enzyme that breaks down oxalic acid. It's found in a lot of like tomatoes, other fruits, bananas, and a lot of grasses. So what they were able to do is they took the genes from the wheat plant and were able to um, you know, splice it so they could transfer the genes for that enzyme and put it into germ cells of American chestnut grown in culture. And then when they took some of those cells and were able to make a chestnut tree out of it, they found that it did have some blight resistance that was even much better than the Chinese chestnut when it was exposed to a very virulent uh, uh, strain of the blight. Um, so the concern with this though is that since this is a genetically modified organism, it's got to go through all the you know, government regulation and making sure that it's safe if this is something that we want to release to the environment. So, you know, with all the other work that's been done with, that's had some negative effects, there's a lot of, you know, uh, public resistance to GMOs being uh, uh, spread in the environment. Um, 
you know, with everything, we've got to weigh the benefits against the risks, you know, and, uh, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the arguments for doing this is that it's a naturally occurring enzyme, so we're not really introducing anything new to the environment. You know, it's something that's already out there. We just put it in this tree to give it some, uh, uh, a chance to fight off the blight. Um, one of the big arguments against it, though, that I've heard is that these days there's a big thing about being organic and a lot of people are trying to get non-GMO certification. So if there are chestnut growers and if this pollen's being spread airborne, you know, how can they prove that their product is non-GMO if we release it in the environment? So, um, so what, the next step that we're trying to do is actually to conserve a lot of the genetic diversity of the American chestnut. You know, every day with development, since these things are still surviving by the roots, every area that gets developed, they just wipe everything out and you have no idea if there are chestnut roots there surviving. Uh, so what we want to do is create orchards where we take, hopefully we can find trees that are producing, producing nuts and just plant the nuts. Um, we want to get 10 trees from each different mother tree um, through various regions in the state. So we'll let them continue to reproduce on their, you know, uh, transfer their genes to each other and keep a, you know, the genetic variability alive in these orchards. Um, the other way we can do it, since there aren't very many trees that are actually flowering and producing nuts, uh, there are other ways we can get around that. One of them we're planning on doing is to try to find sprouts that are just growing in the woods, and even though they'll never flower, we can take some small clippings from them and try to graft them onto other trees in pots and then plant them in these orchards so they'll still have the same genetic code as the, the parent tree. And that would be another way that we can get those trees to flower and, and, and uh, conserve their, their germplasm. Plant Genome Research Project. So they're trying to find a lot of these trees you know, that are rare these days to help. Uh, basically, you can use this to identify any tree that's you know, considered rare these days. When somebody reports an American chestnut, we get that information with the location of the tree. Uh, it asks you to take a picture of the tree. Like in the, you go into the app and it'll go right to your phone so you can take a picture of it and then tell us about other things, uh, you know, whether it's flowering, if it's produced any burrs or not, if you see any burrs on the ground. If somebody reports it, we'll get a hold of you, and then on the website, you can see a map where all the, the trees have been reported. So the important thing is we want to identify them so we could, if, even if they're saplings, um, we'd like to know about that too, because like I said, we're going to try to collect um, some of the, uh, what we call cyan wood for grafting. In order to do that, though, we have to collect the wood in the wintertime, and it's hard to tell an American chestnut in the wintertime. <laughs> so what we're going to do is during the growing season, we're going to go and just put some kind of a, a tag on it just to show that it's a, a chestnut. We'll also collect a sample to send to make be sure that it's an American chestnut. There's a way we can look at the leaves even under a microscope to tell if it's a hybrid or if it's just a pure American. Um, there's also another app which I think is a little bit more popular called iNaturalist. Um, I've gone into their app and looked to see, you can sort out where American chestnuts are and a lot more people are reporting them on there. Um, some of the best ways to find chestnuts, right now they're flowering. Um, it's very, actually you saw in the pictures when the trees were flowering all those fuzzy white um, branch tips. Those are the, um, the pollen anthers opening up to spread the pollen. So that's a, a very good time to find chestnuts when they're blooming like that. Another time is um, in the fall when the trees lose their leaves. Chestnuts are just like oaks where they'll hang on to their leaves longer. So that's an easy way. Once all the other leaves are down, you know, you could see, you know, uh, chestnut leaves. The Do problem they is, color? yeah, they, they turned like a ye uh, yellow brownish, basically. The problem is so do beech trees and the leaves do look yeah. a lot of light. It's not definitive for being a chestnut tree, but that's a better way to see, you know, where chestnut sprouts might be. And to see um, if anything's producing nuts um, in the wintertime too, sometimes the tree will hold onto a few burrs at the top of the tree or even if you're walking, you see a whole bunch of burrs on the bottom of the, on the ground next to the tree. That's another way to know that it's an American chestnut. So we do want to be sure that it's an American chestnut. So we just ask people if they could to um, um, just get a sample of a couple leaves and a twig um, and then put it between two um, thin pieces of cardboard. Usually like corrugated cardboard is best um, to keep it flat and then just send it through the mail to our, um, our regional science coordinator with uh, the address is there. This is, this is on our website at uh, acf.org um, if people want to get the instructions for doing that. Um, 
like I say, if you do report one there, we'll get a hold of you and we can even go out and get the sample and send it too. So, but if, if you want to take that step, that would definitely help us out in confirming that it's an American chestnut tree. Um, another way to help is even just by becoming a member of our organization. We're always looking for um, more support and uh, we do a lot of activities such as going on hikes looking for chestnut trees and uh, putting on presentations. Uh, we do a lot of orchard work. We have uh, maintenance and planting in our orchards. A yearly meeting too where we have a guest lecturer come and give a, uh, a presentation on, uh, on chestnuts or something similar.